stars that are embroidered into the tapestry of the night sky have guided Māori people since the beginning of time. These stars enabled Māori to traverse the greatest expanse of ocean on the planet to arrive here in Aotearoa. It also guided their day-to-day -day activities by combining the rising and setting of stars with the lunar phases and the position of the sun, Māori were able to sync their lifestyles to the natural rhythms of the environment and understand that this environment would dictate to them when they could plant and harvest, when they could hunt and fish, when they could interact, and when they needed to spend time in isolation planning and preparing for another season. This knowledge existed within every tribal group and drove our activities every day, every month, every season, and from year to year, from winter to summer, and back again to winter. So this program is about us exploring the depth of knowledge that pertains to Māori astronomy, and in particular, Matariki. It is a journey that goes beyond what we know, it goes beyond what we have experienced, and it goes beyond Matariki. What is Matariki? Matariki is a group of stars that have significant meaning and purpose for cultures right throughout the world. From one side of the planet to the next, Matariki is observed and celebrated and has become part of so many different cultural practices and beliefs. Most of the world know it as the Pleiades, but here in in Aotearoa and right across Polynesia and the greater part of the Pacific. It is known as Matariki and it has a number of significant applications and meanings for us here. Firstly, Matariki, rising of that group of stars in the winter morning sky before the sun here in Aotearoa is part of our division of time and it is this unique and special timekeeping system that Māori applied that would sync and put into rhythm the rest of the year. And so our year is unlike a Western year that follows a solar calendar system or the journey of the Earth around the Sun. We followed a lunar stellar system which follows the rhythms and the ebbs and flows of the environment and sitting at the heart of our timekeeping system and our interaction with the world and all of our ecology, it all begins and pivots around Matariki. So when Matariki rises in the morning and the winter, the rest of our entire year, timekeeping system, activities, harvest, planting, fishing, lunar phases, it all attributes itself back to the rising of that star cluster. And so number one, it is part of this astronomical timekeeping system that Māori applied and lived their lives by, day to day, month to month, season to season, year to year. Number two, Matariki is spiritual and a very strong spiritual connection to that group of stars. So when it sets in the autumn, in the western sky next to the sun, we believe that our dead have gone to the underworld. For a month they are missing and Matariki is missing from sight until it returns again with the rising sun on the eastern horizon about a month later. And in that moment, our ancestors called out the names of the dead who had passed throughout the year and the spirits were cast into the sky and they became part of the cosmos. And as stars against the chest of the night sky, they shone there 
and they shine there for eternity. Number three, Matariki is social. So Matariki gathers people together. Hence it's called Matariki Hunganui, meaning Matariki, the gatherer of people. And it marks our new year and gathers people to celebrate, remembering the past, celebrating the present and planning for the future. And so it was the most significant celebration within the Māori calendar. Number four, Matariki is connected to our environment. I have nine stars within the Matariki cluster. Now, there are variances of how many stars are in that cluster based on a number of factors. Right throughout the world, there are records of six, seven, nine, 12, and in some parts of the world, even 15, that were viewed with the naked eye. My record has nine, and those nine stars are connected to various domains, mostly environmental. One is connected to the earth and the food that grows in the gardens. One is connected to everything above your head, like trees, berries and birds. One of the stars is connected to fresh water, the lakes and the rivers, and all of the food sources that come from those domains. One is connected to the ocean, and all of the fish and all of the creatures that live within that space. One is connected to rain, and one is connected to winds. All of these various aspects that make up our entire environment are associated with a various star within the Matariki cluster. And the final two stars are connected to our spirituality, the dead and the promise of the new year. Finally, Matariki has an association with navigation. Our traditional seafaring ancestors and wayfinders used Matariki to help them navigate from the various islands of the Pacific here to Aotearoa and backwards and forwards. So this humble cluster, tight cluster of stars that is viewed throughout the world has a particular purpose for us and meaning for us here in Aotearoa. It was the biggest and most significant celebration of the year. It really regulated our entire yearly cycle, all of our activities and the way we lived our lives. And it sits at the heart of Māori practice, of Māori environmental beliefs, of Māori spirituality and ritual, and a unique and special part of our identity and culture. So today, and in particular in the last 30 years, there has been a renaissance around Matariki. It began with various smaller groups in some communities and then organisations like Te Papa Tongarewa started to be central in the regeneration of Matariki and knowledge around Matariki and the practice of Matariki. There are still people in the Māori society and within the culture who maintain the traditional celebrations. They maintain the traditional rituals and they still celebrate Matariki as our ancestors did, farewelling the dead, cooking food for Matariki, celebrating the new year and sinking in their lives as much as possible with our traditional calendar system and our traditional activities. But for most New Zealanders, it's become a celebration of nationhood and national identity. And the reason is, is the way we celebrate Matariki and what it means to us here as Māori is unique. And it's unique to us where we are in the world. And so as our nation has evolved and has perhaps starting to come of age, we're starting to reflect on what we celebrate and why we celebrate we are starting to reflect on celebrations like Guy Fawkes and even Christmas and Easter and New Year 
and these celebrations and activities that were imported from the Northern Hemisphere. And we're starting to think about our own unique and special homegrown celebrations that have always been part of this landscape. And so in that way, Matariki is informing and Matariki is encouraging the development of our national identity. So in midwinter, when you have a look at the sun and it's rising, it rises and sets relatively quickly. In winter, we get very short days, very long nights, and the sun arcs or bows across the sky. It doesn't really rise directly above your head. And so we have this long division of night. Māori call that Ngāpō Tūtanga Nui o Pipiri, or the long nights of Pipiri. So the winter period has a number of names for Māori, and Māori gave a number of names to this coldest time of the year. The most commonly and universal name for winter is Hōtoke, which seems to be used generally for the first three months of the Māori year. The other name, Takurua, is the same as Hōtoke, but it is in reference to Hine Takurua, the star, and the fact that that star is seen in the morning during those first three months of the Māori year. And another name that our ancestors gave was Faturua. Faturua means to be double-chinned. It's in reference to a kereru. And kereru were taken during this time of the year and it was when they were in their best condition. They were fat. And often you'll see like a kereru will have its head virtually sunken into its chest because it's just got this big barrel chest as it sits on the tree eating meadow berries during this period of time. And hence the word faturua was also another term that our ancestors gave to the winter period. Now those are the seasons, the names for the season. There were also the names for the first three months of the Māori year. These are Pipiri, Hongongoi, and Hereturi Koka. All of these names, and in fact, all of the names that we have for our months are stars. And these stars rise on the horizon just before the sun during that month. And our ancestors would look to those stars and realize at the next new moon, that month would start. And the new moon, and then the moon cycle would would go through its different phases and stars would continue to rise earlier and earlier and then the following month the next star would come up and on the new moon your next month would start. And so these stars are markers. Not only are they markers but the names given to those stars that mark the different months are actually an indication of the events and activities that are happening during that time. Pipiri means to cling together or come together to huddle together. There is a saying, pipiri ki te rangi, pipiri ki te venua. Like pipiri gathers together and clings together in the sky, people should gather together and cluster and hold on to one another on the earth. And pipiri is a twin star. So it rises close together in the early morning of the first month of the Māori year and you know what month you're in. The second star, Hongongoi, also Hongonui to some people, means to be crouched down because of the severe cold. And it was a time where people would crouch and keep their limbs clenched to their chest just to maintain warmth. And the third month of this winter period, Hereturi Koka gets its name from people kneeling and, and crouching down very close to the fire with their knees exposed to the flames and the embers, a burning kind of charred appearance would be taken on by the knees. And so hereturi koka is a reference to the knees which are charred because people are sitting very close to the fire trying to be warm in this very cold and bitter time of the Māori calendar. According to Māori beliefs, Hine Takurua 
is the daughter of Tangaroa Akiukiu. So Tangaroa Akiukiu has two daughters. One is Hene Takurua, the winter maiden. The other one is Hene Raumati, the summer maiden. And both of them are the wives of Tamanui Te Ra, or the sun. Now, because of her father, Hene Takurua has a very strong association and connection to the ocean. And it is said often when species of eel and fish go out to the ocean to spawn, they go out to Hene Takurua to spawn during the winter months. So uh, she is connected to the open ocean because she rises far out into the ocean and when the sun is with his winter maiden, with his winter wife, he is way off into the ocean, far away from the earth. And that's the reason why the earth becomes cold and the earth becomes very unproductive because the sun is very far away. Now together they have a number of children. They are all stars and they are grouped around Sirius or Hine Takurua. And each and every one of these stars represents a different element or aspect of the winter months. One is connected to snow, one is connected to sleet, one is connected to cold rain, one is connected to the uh, strong winds of winter, one is connected to very still winter nights. There are all of these children and when they are seen in the early morning before the sun rises, depending upon which one is bright will really let you know what your weather is going to be like for the next couple of days. So if Takurua Fariana is very, very bright, you know that in the next couple of days, it's probably going to snow. And so these are weather indicators as well. And all of the children that descend from Hine Takurua and Tamanui Te Ra are part of the winter weather phenomenon that happens every year. a number of activities that did take place during these cold months. Bearing in mind that the new year happens after the harvest. It happens when the root crops from the gardens are stored away in the storehouses and in the storage pits. So people are actually eating the harvest from autumn. So there generally is a lot of food during this period and there's not a lot of fishing or eeling going on or many of these activities that take up the major part of the year, except for the lamprey or the piharo, which uh, return from the sea at the rising of Matariki every year and began spawning. And this is when it was taken in massive numbers. The other food sources that were harvested at this time were the kereru, or the native uh, wood pigeon, which was a prized delicacy in some areas. Two other birds were taken at this time as well, the tui and the kaka. And they were also prized food sources and were very fat during the winter months. So this is when they were harvested. Not a lot of blooming activity happening uh, during this period in terms of the forest, because it's cold, except for the puawananga, or the clematis. And that is a sign that, when it is seen, that the first blooms of winter are happening. And a very important sign that summer will come back because life starts to come back to the forest in particular. And you'll see these massive bunches of white flowers blooming all over the forest canopy. The muki, the fish, was also harvested and taken at this time in uh, great quantities within particular tribes, a very important food source. And so these were the major food taking activities, but because mostly people were at home trying to stay warm, there was a lot of discussion happening, a lot of planning. People were feasting together, eating together, and spending time with one another. And that leads to another important activity during this time of year, very close to where Pipiri the star rises, 
is another star called Toranui. Toranui means a great erection. There is a deeper meaning to the saying, pipiri ki te rangi, pipiri ki te whenua. When pipiri clings in the heavens, you should cling to each other on earth. And it's about procreation. And it's about taking that time to spend with your significant other. The philosophy is, and the theory is, if you partake in sexual activities during that period, then nine months later, in about February, you will have a child born, and that child will be born just as the harvest is happening. So the mother partakes in the fresh harvest and all the goodness out of the environment and out of the soil and partakes in that food and it comes out through her milk and it is the most nutritious and best way to start your introduction into the world. So that is another aspect of the colder months that's built into this larger philosophy of what Matariki is. If you look at any animal in the environment, it does not maintain a consistent level of nutrition and a consistent level of well-being. It fluctuates. There are times in the environment when animals are very healthy and then there are other times when they are lean and they go through this cycle of highs and lows, peaks and troughs. They are fat, they are lean. They are abundant, then they are difficult to find. That is the cycle of everything, except for mankind. Because mankind has manipulated the environment for where we are maintained at this very comfortable, constant level all of the time throughout the entire year. We don't eat seasonally, we don't behave seasonally, we don't work hard in the summer and then rest in the winter. We're just consistent. Eat what we want to eat, when we want to eat, how we want to eat and work non-stop the whole year. And spend times reflecting, gathering their ideas and sinking themselves back into the environment. COVID-19 has taught us, regardless of how much power and money and might we might think we have, the environment is in control. And if the environment says to us, it's time to stop, it's time to stop. And nothing we can do can change what the environment really wants us to do. I think we need to be very clear about time and what time is. Now there is more than one way to tell the time. The time that we understand now, the 24 hours, 365 and a quarter day year, the 12 months, the universalization of time, anywhere that you see it. A clock in the middle of a town, the bells that ring in a church, that is all a symbol of British expansion and colonialism and one of the most significant and biggest forms of colonization is time. And when you start to regulate when people do something, how they do something, and why they do something, it's all driven by meeting the divisions and our understanding of how our time is regulated. So we are fully committed to the Gregorian Western solar system of timekeeping that has absolutely no connection to where we are in the world. It does not align with seasonal variations, lunar phases, what's happening in the environment. We celebrate New Year's the same day, 1st of January every year, because other parts of the world do it that day. It has no connection to the sun, no connection to what's happening in our world. And one of the things that's so important about what this show is trying to do is to reclaim our timekeeping systems and reclaim Matariki as the marker of when we start and when we end because it's completely and totally relevant to who we are and where we are. Oh,
Take it.